What's up, everyone? Welcome to the Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition Power Gamers Tactics Room. I'm your host, Bill Brian Bafflestone. So today we're having another episode of my Deep Dive series, this time looking at my very own character sheet for Bill Brian Bafflestone. I've had a ton of requests for this, and I have a session starting in about 30 minutes, and I just finished updating my character sheet, and I was like, oh, wow, this would be a perfect chance to procrastinate more on my Cavalier videos <laughs> uh, and talk a little bit about my own character, decisions I made, why I set them up in a certain way, what spells I take, what tactics I use, blah, 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 all that stuff that I presume people want to see based on the requests that I've gotten from viewers. So without further ado, let's jump right in and take a look and see what I've got here. So I have put the first segment of Bill Braun's character sheet on the screen and you can see the basic setup. So I chose the Spurf Neblin or Deep Gnome race for Bilbron Bafflestone. If I could do it all over again, I would choose Goblin for that juicy bonus action hide, but I really liked the Deep Gnome because this was an Underdark campaign, so of course it fits in terms of role playing. The Deep Gnome got a plus two on intelligence and a plus one on dex, so that's perfect. This of course was before Tasha's came out and allowed you to swap the stats around. And the Deep Gnome has the ability to stealth at advantage in rocky terrain, which is also another fantastic power for the Underdark. And it fit in with my character concept, because as we see, I took the criminal spy background. I was joining an all-cleric party, and they had no rogue, no wizard, and no face. So I decided to go in that direction, as the whole character concept was kind of coming together for me. And so I have gone with Cleric of Berevar Cloak Shadow, or the Trickery Domain, and Wizard Chronergist. However, I was originally an Enchanter. Again, I had never played in 5th edition, and I was going based on my initial analysis of the player's handbook, and of all of the available archetypes. I settled on Enchanter because I really love the Enchanter powers from top to bottom. I really love Instinctive Charm. And it just fit into my role-playing concept of this guy being the sort of person that goes out and hangs out with the underworld and all of that. However, that was a super bad choice, as it turns out, because I had also never played in an Underdark campaign. I was not aware that almost everything is resistant or immune. And while this didn't kill me in early levels, even though we fought a lot of drow, and that's not fun because they are resistant, as we got higher and higher in levels, it just became so debilitating, I would never use the abilities. And when Tasha's came out allowing subclass changes, I went to my DM and I was like, can I switch in a couple of levels? And he was like, if you're not happy, I'll let you switch right away. Just write me a little story as to how it happened. So boom, one four page story later, I switched over to Chronergy and it is way, way better. So I am currently level 2 in Cleric and level 9 in Wizard. I just leveled in the last session. However, this was an all-Cleric campaign and my DM forced the two Cleric levels on me. That wasn't my own decision. If I could do it all over again, I would probably take one level in Artificer and then the rest of my levels in Wizard. Or if I still had to take two Cleric levels and Twilight Cleric was available, I probably would have taken that. Because 300 feet of Dark Vision in a environment in which most people have 120 is just silly good. I would be kiting people left and right, and my party included a couple of humans, and so them not having dark vision is actually kind of a pain in my butt. And so if I were a Twilight Cleric, being able to gift them supreme dark vision as well would just be really, really cool. So a couple of things that I would do different, but I'm not too unhappy with the way that Bill Braun is set up here. I am only 15k experience away from my next level, which is weird because it took 21,000 experience to gain 11th and only 15,000 now to gain 12th. So, all right, I'll take it. You see my inspiration bank, and this is a homebrew system. We are allowed to bank up to two inspiration per night or per session, and my DM allows us to change in these inspirations at a rate of 20 for a plus one ASI or a skill proficiency or expertise. I kind of like this system. It allows us to take feats at our level ups and gain our ASIs through other means. So we can see that my stat array is 8 strength, 14 dex, 12 con, 20 intelligence, 14 wisdom, and 10 charisma. 
If it weren't for this homebrew system, my intelligence would only be 18 right here. And I don't consider that too debilitating. I actually don't cast too many spells that call for saving throws or attack rolls. And being able to memorize one less spell would be annoying, but certainly not debilitating. I almost went with 12 Charisma and only 10 Constitution, because I had to do a 10 and a 12 in those. But ultimately I put my faith in my ability to roleplay and cast buffs for interactions, because the plus one on con saves, concentration checks, and hit points I just thought was better overall. Now we can look at my Terms of Engagement suite. I have a passive perception of 22, I have a passive investigation of 25. And in my campaign, if I roll below my passive, it bumps to that floor. So I always have 22 on perception and 25 on investigation. I roll my initiative at plus 12 at advantage. And my terms of engagement suite of powers are that I have alert so that I can never be surprised and have great initiative. I have a bat familiar who has 60 foot blind sight and standing orders to alert me to invisible creatures in that area. I have a homunculus wearing a helm of telepathy that gives me 30 foot psychic detection as standing orders. I have good stealth and the ability to cast invisibility. I can cast Sea Invisible and I do so quite aggressively as I'll discuss later. Through the Helm of Telepathy I can detect thoughts at will. And I have Contact Other Plane which I cast very aggressively because it's just a ritual with no internal restrictions on how often I can cast it unlike some of the cleric divination spells. And I have Legend Lore. So basically you can't surprise me, you can't beat me on initiative, you can't surprise me by sneaking up on me in any way. You can't hide from my senses. I can hide from your senses pretty easily. I know what you're thinking. I can spam contact other plane to learn anything I want. I can cast legend lore to learn anything I want about items or places. I'm plugged into a criminal network and I have elite passive perception and investigation. So in the terms of engagement, I am absolutely elite and that's how I like it. I like to know what's going on, I like to be in control, I like to school people who think they can take advantage of me, I pay a lot of attention and put a lot of investment into the terms of engagement, and you can see how I've set it up and the results at this point. Next I have a 19 AC, that's pretty standard, I'm only adding a plus one breastplate there, but otherwise my dex and a shield gets me there. Don't forget I also have alert. So I am attacked at disadvantage when I'm obscured, which is practically all the time. And I do have summons and a shield guardian, so typically they are standing in front of me to provide half cover. And of course this shield guardian also gives me a plus two on the AC as a reaction. So under most circumstances, you're not touching me. I am always obscured, my AC is super high, and then I can throw in the shield spell on top of that. So yeah, I haven't really been hit too often. Unimpressive hit points, only 58 with my homunculus, but don't forget I have a shield guardian that absorbs half, plus I never take damage anyway. My saves aren't that great except for my wisdom saves, and I have advantage on those because gnome cunning is awesome and one of the main reasons that I chose this for Neblin Race. For feats I took observant at 4 and alert at 8. I really agonized over this because I have been wanting alert like since I started this game. But I ultimately chose Observant because that bumped my intelligence up to 18 and it bumped my passive perception and passive investigation, which were not good. They started at 12 and 13 and that wasn't good enough in this game. So I decided to invest in it and now I have elite passive perception and investigation. For my skills, I have roguish faceish skills. I didn't know about custom background when I was going through the player handbook, or I definitely would have added perception and investigation, but I didn't, and I'll probably add those through my DM's homebrew inspiration system. And I just keep a little note to remind me of the ways that I can bump up my skills through guidance, through the familiar help action, and because I have a boon of my god that allows me advantage on stealth, deception, and sleight of hand checks. Then my special abilities, I have the superior dark vision, I have the advantage on stealth rolls in rocky terrain, I have no cunning, and again the advantage on stealth in rocky terrain is amazing for an underdark campaign. Really fits nicely into my high wizard build. Then my chronergy powers, I have chronal shift, temporal awareness, and momentary stasis. And then my divine powers, I have blessing of the trickster, which is fantastic on my familiar when he's scouting to get that advantage on stealth. Invoke duplicity, which is still awesome for trickiness and was a go-to strategy for me in my early levels. 
Harness Divine Power, which is awesome since I rarely use my Invoke Duplicity anymore, so I can just pump out a Channel Divinity every short rest to get back a second level spell slot. And I have earned, as I mentioned, a boon from my god that gives me a little bump on my attack rolls and advantage on Stealth, Deception, and Sleight of Hand. Next, let's look at my spell loadout. So you see the slots I have available. My save DC is 17 right now. Attack bonus is 10. If I ever use a hand crossbow, it's only plus 7. And these are the spells that I roll with. From the cleric side of things, I carry the Guidance, Mending, and Toll the Dead Cantrips. I have Charm Person and Disguise Self for Trickery Domain. And the spells that I've chosen are Guiding Bolt, Healing Word, Sanctuary, and Protection from Good and Evil. Guiding Bolt is my one reliable blast that I keep around in the very rare instance that I want to blast something. Healing Word is always amazing as a ranged bonus action heal that can bring up my colleagues when they go unconscious. Sanctuary is super fantastic when combined with Hypnotic Gaze, when combined with Invisible, cast on my Familiar, cast on my Phantom Steed, I just love Sanctuary. As a bonus action, no concentration defense. And protection from good and evil, of course, is a mainstay if you're facing any kind of extra planar creature that can charm or frighten, and I'm always happy to have it in those cases. On the wizard side of things, for my cantrips, I have Firebolt, Mind Sliver, Sapping Sting, and Ray of Frost memorized. They're all attack cantrips. Two are based on attack rolls and different energy types. Two are based on saving throws and different energy types and offer two elite debuffs the minus four on their next save for Mind Sliver, and going prone for Sapping Sting. Then the spells that I have prepared, of course, Shield and Absorb Element are wizard mainstays. You've got to have them. Rope Trick is a go-to panic button spell that I cast when things go sideways and I want to enter total safety. But because I have Servants, I can also manipulate the rope up and down every single round. So I can hide in safety. On my turn, I can crawl down the rope, take an action, and then climb back up the rope, and then my familiar will pull the rope back up. I use my own interact with object to lower the rope. So this does briefly expose me, just in case any enemies have readied actions, but I always do this in obscurement, so they're attacking me at disadvantage. They can't use a bunch of really good sight spells. This is a very reliable combination. I have Enhance Ability because I have a Mitzium Apparatus, and I find that it's very helpful to cast Enhance Ability on Intelligence to get advantage on checks like Dispel Magic, on Arcana, and on Counterspell. It's also great when I'm investigating things, maybe trying to find intel through my criminal network or locate magic items. I have Sea Invisible because this is a really good spell in my campaign. My DM doesn't really strictly follow the... 5e invisible rules. He's still got a lot of other game systems in his head. So I do remind him when I am dealing with invisibility myself, but when he's running creatures that are like spying on us invisibly or whatever, I don't have any control over that. And he always forgets to like tell us what square they're in because of the sound. And so invisible is actually quite a bit more powerful in his campaign than it's supposed to be. And so I am aggressively constantly casting see invisible. It lasts an hour, there is no concentration, and it sees things other than creatures. I can see portals, I can see glyphs, I can see all sorts of stuff. So see invisible was literally the first second level spell I added and I just cast it aggressively. I used to carry Misty Step, but I have given it up since I can now cast Dimension Door, but at lower levels Misty Step is a must-have. Tiny Servant is a go-to for me. Remember that I, for most of my career, always had a couple of dead spell levels that I couldn't cast from and would have to upcast into. And Tiny Servant is just amazing for upcasting. As soon as I got it, I had fourth level slots available. So I have never since that point gone without at least three Tiny Servants. And I have often rolled with 10 or more. And I just love Tiny Servant because it's an always on no action needed set of allies that have a pretty significantly strong attack, particularly since they have blind sight and I use obscurement a lot, but also just has a ton of defensive and utility uses. I give a bunch of them standing orders that I can trigger with just a word. Others I can control with my bonus action and I have very little bonus action clog. So Tiny Servant is one of my signature spells. Then of course I have Dispel Magic. It is absolutely critical for handling enemy spellcasters. I currently have Counterspell, even though I don't like it much. 
because I do like having it available, and when I do want to cast it, I don't want to have to go through the Mitzium with a potential chance of failure, albeit very small. Haste is another one that I have to be able to cast regularly because I'm constantly putting it into my spell storing items and then casting it on party members for fun. Sleet Storm is another go-to that I don't want to have to worry about the Mitzium. I just want to be able to cast it whenever I want because I cast it all the time. It is literally my signature spell. I carry Polymorph because that's a great offense. It's great utility. It's a great panic button. It's just one of the best spells out there. Dimension Door because that is also one of the best spells out there. No sight needed, good range, great panic button. Stone Shape. One of my favorite spells, particularly in the Underdark, because it's an ultimate defense that is immune to dispel magic. And Bigby's Arcane Hand, because while I can cast any 5th level spell I want, the Arcana roll is getting a little iffier up there, and Bigby's is one that I want to be able to cast whenever I want reliably, because it is so versatile. One, if I'm fighting something that has blind sight and is immune to my obscurement tricks, I want Interposing Hand so it can never get within 15 feet of me or closer than 15 feet to me. The grasping thing is amazing if I want to grapple a huge creature with a great chance of success. The push is fantastic for throwing things into area of effect. So I really like having Bigby's hand available. But keep in mind, I do have a Mitzium, so I can cast any spell I want. These spells are chosen with that in mind. Without the Mitzium, I would drop Enhance Ability, Counter Spell, and Haste, and I would add Invisibility, Slow, and Wall of Force, and I might even try and squeeze in a Transmute Rock in there. I'd have to think about it. I would definitely take Transmute Rock at my next level. Now, of course, I also have a full array of rituals. I cast them when I'm supposed to. I cast Water Breathing on the party every day, and my go-tos are Phantom Steed and Contact Other Plane. I spam these spells all day long because they are amazing, and as rituals, I can do them as much as I want. My subdomain abilities are Chronal Shift and Momentary Stasis, and in my campaign, unlike a lot of other campaigns, so your mileage may vary, I have a lot of ways to offload my concentration. I have two spell gems, I have a shield guardian, and I'm one level away from arcane abeyance. So currently I have my familiar carrying the third level spell gem, in which I keep a sleet storm. My homunculus, I keep enhance ability. It's dedicated to that because I need it when I'm using my Mitzium apparatus and making arcana checks and I like to have it in battle in case I have to do a Dispel Magic or a Counter Spell. And I have attuned my Homunculus to my Helm of Telepathy, and since we have Shared Mind and it has an intelligence of 10, it can autonomously read surface thoughts, detect psychic creatures, cast a suggestion when I want it to. It's a really nice synergy there. Finally, in my Shield Guardian, I have him cast Haste. It is suboptimal. It probably should be Polymorph, but I like to make things fun for my party, and Haste is actually a pretty good spell when you're casting it on a Paladin. That extra AC, that extra move, and that extra attack are all really fantastic. I might also have Gordo cast that Haste on me so that I can get a Haste action hide out of it to go with my Obscurement. Now because I have a Mitzium, I also keep a list of available Cleric and Wizard spells that I might want to cast. Obviously it's a huge list. I put in bold ones that I really don't want to forget about. And this just gives me elite versatility, already one of the strengths of a wizard. And now I can cast any cleric or wizard spell at up to 6 level. So yeah, pretty crazy. I also short rest trick some spells, because even though I argued passionately against this sort of thing with my DM, he said, no, as I read it, you can do it. So I am very stingy with my spells throughout the day, and I try and carry as many open spell slots into a long rest, and then I cast these spells, and then I get them back. If I go through a day where we just travel and I don't cast any spells, I start the next day with like 25 tiny servants, a gift of alacrity, and a death ward, and all of my spell slots. Hey, I don't make the rules, I just play in them. Like I said, I tried to tell my DM that that was probably overpowered, and he was like, nah, that's how I read it, so okay. I also have a couple of permanent spells. I have a contingency for freedom of movement when my move is impeded. Check out my video on contingency for my thought process about all of that. And I have a permanent image, major image cast at 6th level, of black smoke in a 20-foot cube. It's just always around me. I move it with my action. If combat starts, I stay in that area and I don't move it around. 
My party already knows about it, so they have disbelieved it, and so it doesn't impede them when we're traveling or anything. And when we encounter things in the course of travel, we are in control. They see nothing but black smoke. We see them and can choose our actions accordingly. Finally, unfortunately, I cannot use Summon Lesser or Greater Demon, and I can't use Planar Binding, the DM Bandit. Otherwise, I would be spamming Summon Greater Demon left and right, and I would have a whole bunch of them planar bound to be my little pets that I can employ without taking any actions except talking. Now, I do carry some magical equipment. I always have two scrolls of Misty Step in case I get grappled and silenced, and then I need to teleport out of it. I also have a bunch of potions of healing and other potions and other equipment that I can use to buff myself. And you can see I have a little reminder of all the things I can do. Wild Root for Poison, Willow Shade Oil for Petrification, Black Sap versus Charm or Frightened, Marusa Balm versus Fire Resist, Olabusa Leaf versus Exhaustion, Perfume of Bewitching to give me advantage on interactions. I mean, I am a Batman with a utility pelt, basically. I like to have lots of stuff around for a rainy day. And I've also cast a bunch of Magic Mouths. Check out my recent deep dive on Magic Mouth for how to totally take advantage of that. And I just want to point out that I actually don't leverage Magic Mouth to its full abilities. They're largely redundant with what I can already do, and I'm just taking it easy on the DM. I try to be a good player, and I don't want to bog him down with a bunch of that sort of minutia. Then we can see my spell book, and this doesn't offer as much value as I'd like it to because I've captured a spell book or two and picked up a bunch of scrolls and stuff that I've added to the book. And honestly, it was so long ago that I don't really remember which ones I took at my level up. But you can see the sort of spells that I like. I don't carry blasts. Most of my stuff is control. Most of my stuff is utility. Most of my stuff is terms of engagement. Most of my stuff are specific defenses to attack specific offenses. I like to be able to move around. I like to be able to divine things. I like to have elite defenses. So all of those things have influenced what spells I've chosen as I've moved forward. Then you can see some of my equipment. Again, a Batman utility belt type of approach. I've captured hand crossbows and drow poison bolts that I will use sometimes. I carry three doses of Essence of Ether Poison because it's the best poison. Check out my Deep Dive series video on poisons to get more information about that. Obviously the stuff I need to cast spells, my Thieves Tools and Disguise Kit. I carry chains around. One carries the MacGuffin and chains it to my back. The other for utility use. Also a bunch of manacles for when we take prisoners. Crowbar, net, earplugs, antitoxin, which I take all the time. Smoke sticks which I use all the time, which is a homebrew thing. And I don't even need to use it anymore because I have an ever-smoking bottle. A bunch of acid in case I need to send my tiny servants to melt something. And then you can see my list of magic items. So I have a pretty significant amount of magic items. Though keep in mind this campaign has been going on for a year and a half, and we never find loot. And most of my items are uncommon with a couple of rares in there. So my premier item is the Shield Guardian. Obviously no control over that. The DM is either going to love you or not. <laughs> a breastplate plus one. Magic armor is pretty standard. Sentinel shield, which is fantastic because it gives me that advantage on initiative and advantage on perception checks, which also grants a plus five to my passive perception. So yeah, love that one. No attunement. Yeah, awesome. A bag of holding, of course, pretty standard for a lot of campaigns. We have like three in my party. Ever smoking bottle, if I ever need obscurement. Enduring Spellbook, just a common thing to keep my spells safe. And now my attuned items. I have Winged Boots. In this campaign, we started with an Uncommon of Choice, and that's the one I chose. Almost went with Broom of Flying because of the lack of attunement thing, but ultimately I decided for a sneaky type of character, I wanted the Winged Boots. Plus, there's just some logistical issues about falling off of your broom, and I just didn't want to have to deal with that. I have a Mitzium Apparatus, which I just acquired and has completely changed the approach to the character. I'll probably do a deep dive just on that item at some point because it transforms your abilities so greatly and yet in a way that some DMs and players will be like, it doesn't really add anything, you don't gain any resources. So yeah, I'll talk about that, but God, so amazing. I can cast so many more spells now. I have so much flexibility. I have so many ways to respond to potential threats. It's just sickening. 
We have a stone speaker crystal that I almost never use, but I will attune to it if I want a plus five bump to my passive investigation. I'll attune to it if I'm casting a divination and I don't want to use any components. If I ever need to speak with dead or speak with plants or something, it can come in handy. So whatever, that's one that I found and I don't really use that often. And then as mentioned, I have two spell gems to offload concentration, a third and a second level. Those are amazing and fantastic. And I have a Helm of Telepathy. Check out my Deep Dive series video on Helm of Telepathy to see how that can break your game. It is just so ridiculous when it comes to gathering intel, spying, terms of engagement. And because my homunculus has shared mind, I can offload it to him. I free up an attunement slot, which I can use on something else. And just really, really elegant synergy there. One thing about the spell gems, actually, I should go back to. They require attunement, but only to fill it. Once you fill it, you can switch your attunement again. And since you can switch attunement with only a one hour short rest, I just don't normally attune to the spell gems. I try not to use them too aggressively. And when I need to, then I will just reattune to them and fill them back up and then reattune back to my Helm of Telepathy or whatever. So that is the character and how I've constructed him and some of the thought process that went into constructing him in that way. How do I actually play him? Well, of course, I have plan A, plan B, plan C, a whole bunch of different options. But as far as plan A strategies, that's something that I can talk about. So first, I always have a familiar or tiny servant support me with potions and consumables. Check out my Advanced Familiar Tactics deep dive video for more information about that. It's a super nice buff to have that allows me to get away with a lot of cool things. Then in my lower levels, we started this campaign at level three. So I was a first level wizard at this point, remembering that I have two cleric levels. So my go-to plan A was Minor Illusion, Invoke Duplicity plus Hypnotic Gaze, Sleep, and Catapult. So in round one, I would create a Minor Illusion of a steel crate around me once I found the right defensive location. I understand that a lot of guys out there hate this spell and don't allow it to work properly. But we go by the rules as written. And rules as written, if you create an illusion of a steel crate around you, they believe it unless they interact with it or make an investigation check because that's how the rules work. They don't automatically suspect it's an illusion, just like they don't automatically suspect that that wall of fire that you just summoned, or those Everd's black tentacles that you just summoned, or that wall of stone that you just created are illusions. This is a magical world. You can create magical effects, and the rules as written say they believe it unless they interact or make an investigation check. So when you surround yourself with a steel crate, guess what? People stop attacking it because they think it's real and they're like, Oh, no point of attacking a target behind total cover. I'm going to attack somebody else. And then I would attack from inside of that illusion with abilities that had no visible origin so that they don't reveal the illusion. Spells like Catapult, cantrips like Mind Sliver and Sapping Sting and Toll the Dead. That's how I contributed and attacked and stayed safe in my early levels. Then at levels five and six, I added Rope Trick and Dragon's Breath. So my round one was typically Minor Illusion, just like before, and Dragon's Breath as a bonus action, and then my Familiar would attack on round one. And then in round two, I would just keep it up, and if I needed a panic button, I would Rope Trick. As mentioned before, I can attack every round with the Rope Down, or by using a double Interact with Object, combining myself and my Familiar or a Tiny Servant. But I didn't have the spell slots available to cast it regularly, or at least comfortably so, so I left it as a panic button. At level 7 and 8, I added Phantom Steed, Sleet Storm, Slow, and Tiny Servants. So Sleet Storm immediately became my opening move in round 1. It covers my enemies with Obscurement, so they are heavily impeded. They can't cast Sight Spells, they have a hard time getting out of it, they're falling down. It gives us a chance to assess and figure out what we're dealing with. I also had three tiny servants at this point, so I would just throw them into combat pretty quickly. They have blind sight, so they can see in the Sleet Storm. And at this point, I had picked up my third level spell gem, so my familiar could stack a slow on that if I really needed to. Then in round two, I would keep pounding away with my tiny servants, and then I would rope trick. I now have the sufficient slots to cast it regularly, and they can't see me because of the Sleet Storm, so I can just rope trick and unless they burn an action or a reaction to beat my spell save dc on an arcana check 
they have no idea what I did and have no idea that the only means of attacking that position is with a dispel magic. And then I just keep going in round three, and if I need a panic button, I will rope trick or phantom steed retreat at my 200 feet per round. At levels nine and ten, I added fourth level spells, specifically stone shape and dimension door. Would have loved to add summon greater demon here, but the DM didn't want me to break the game. <laughs> so round one, I still open with sleet storm. I attack with my now five times tiny servants. Fargar's still there to slow stuff down if it's a tough battle. Then I go into my rope trick and continue to pound away with Tiny Servants. And then after that, I just keep pounding away and throwing out attack spells, cantrips, or abilities as needed. And when I need a panic button, I still have the Phantom Steed Retreat, but now I have Stone Shape and Dimension Door to go with Rope Trick. So yeah, lots of options to go into total safety whenever I experience even a sniff of danger. And then at level 11, which I just made, I just added a Mitzium Apparatus. So while I still open with Sleet Storm most times, I have a lot of flexibility on how to proceed after that. Finally, some go-to combos that I like to employ. First of all, I always start on a Phantom Steed, so I always have Elite Maneuverability. I operate with a minimum of 5x Tiny Servants, which are always on pets. I can have a ton more if I'm rest tricking. One of the things I like to do with them is to apply multiple 8 hit point good berries because I have a life cleric in the party that can cast it. So I can heal myself or my party for up to 40 hit points in one round. And I would love to add magic stone at some point to this combo so that I can get them to attack at range for 3d6 plus 15 every round, reliably, consistently, and always on. I have an ever smoking bottle and tiny servants, familiars, homunculus, plus the alert feat, so with no loss of actions and a simple command, I can have a very strong defensive position. I use Enhance Ability all the time from the Homunculus for Intelligent Checks at Advantage for the Mitzium's Arcana Checks for Dispel Magic for Counterspell. I like Summon Aberration for Beholder Kin, as that's one of the only combinations that can fly and has a ranged attack. So I keep it on the back line. It provides me half cover. It usually lasts for uh, the full hour. Please see my video on Natasha's summoning spells for more information on my thoughts about those. I often cast Invisibility. I'll upcast it to cover my Phantom Steed, and then I stealth around. I'll sometimes cast Haste on myself to get better move in AC, and more specifically for that extra action hide, so I can still do all of the things I normally like to do in combat and hide in my Obscurement. Another fantastic defense. I aggressively cast the Invisible, as I mentioned before, long duration, no concentration, the DM favors Invisible. When I really want to kill something, Wall of Force plus Sickening Radiance or Dawn or Morden Kanan's Faithful Hound will kill almost any BBEG. I don't need to cast the Dawn myself because my Light Cleric casts it all the time. If I do have to do a personal combo, Sleet Storm plus Transmute Rock, which is no concentration, plus Sickening Radiance or Dawn will kill almost anything. I often roll out my Sleet Storm and Tiny Servants in combination, just great with that blind sight. Already talked about Bigby's Arcane Hand. I like it for interposing versus blind sight creatures. I like it for grappling huge creatures. I like it to push creatures into Dawn or Sleet Storm or Transmute Rock or whatever. I often cast Haste out of my Shield Guardian just because it's fun, even though it's suboptimal. And when I do cast Polymorph, it's typically on my Shield Guardian and turn him into a giant ape and then keep him in the back with me so that he can still provide me half cover and pump out that elite ranged rock attack every round. So that's it. That is Bill Braun Bapplestone. I hope all you viewers that requested it are happy with the breakdown. Let me know what you think about my character creation, about my tactics, uh, all of that. All right? Let's have a discussion. Let me know in the comments. Regardless, thank you so much for watching. This has been the Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition Power Gamers Tactics Room. I'm your host, Bill Braun Bafflestone. See you next time.